Can I now turn to um, Dr. Pete Husemeyer? Um, uh, Dr. Husemeyer did his uh, early work and research in nuclear engineering, uh, and now he makes rugby balls. Uh, I think it's a fairly obvious segue, uh, but perhaps, Dr. Husemeyer, you'd be kind enough to tell us a tiny amount about the segue, but more about Sportable, please. Absolutely. Um, just checking that everyone can see my screen. Excellent. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Jane Baker, Edward Briffer, and Professor Sir Mike Gregory, and the Society for Applied Research for the invitation to speak with you all tonight. It's truly an honor to be here. In previous CSAR lectures, you heard about the dangers of climate change, about the opportunities and responsibilities of artificial intelligence, and even about the incredible power of gene therapy. And I'd like to congratulate Dr. Carol Ebay for her fascinating discussion about her work on the blast fungus and food security. So with all the previous talks like these, I'm sure you're all well equipped for tonight's talk on sports balls. Tonight, I'd like to tell you a personal story about what it was like to leave academia and start a sports technology company with two of my best friends. This talk will not be a founder's success story because we're not a success. In terms of the startup life cycle, we're probably somewhere between the startup and the growth phases. But we've built an exciting company based in Old Street, made up of 23 full-time engineers, data scientists, sports scientists, a radar engineer, embedded front-end and back-end software developers, and a sales and commercial team. We've built what I think is a great product, and we're working with some of the world's best rugby teams, including Saracens, Leicester, Bath, England, England Sevens, and many others on the horizon. We've done live broadcasts in the Championship Cup at Rugby X and with BT Sport, ITV4, Sky Sports, and BBC. But it's all still in play. We don't know if we'll be successful or not, especially given the current circumstances. Things can absolutely go wrong for us, so I thought this would be an interesting story and one that is not often heard the story of a business that is not yet a success and not yet a failure. Tonight, I have the very real honor of addressing a couple, almost a hundred of the brightest minds in Britain and in the world. Many of you will go on to make your own indelible marks in your fields. You'll all learn similar lessons to those that I've learned. But if I can give you a heads up about what is to come, firstly, you'll realize that you're capable of much more than you think. When you think you can't do any more, you can, and in fact, you just do. And in fact, you can just wait until you have kids to really learn this lesson. My second is due in four weeks. The second thing is that mistakes will teach you more about yourself and business than your successes will. And finally, my last few points here is that life is really the gray area between catchphrases and aphorisms. For example, you know, we're always taught to never give up but it's equally true as a saying that you shouldn't flog a dead horse and you can't do both at the same time. And so really the kind of rude awakening is learning about the gray in the middle. And in fact, that brings me to the final point is that uncertainty is the rule and it's not the exception. So the story I'd like to tell you tonight is my own experience. And I hope that after hearing it, you'll be a bit more prepared as you set out to make your mark. To start the story, I'm first going to give you the pitch. I'm going to give you the problem statement and I'm gonna follow it with our solution. But then I'm going to remove the veneer and I'm gonna tell you what it was like setting up the business. The actual blood, sweat and tears, the agony, the ecstasy, the dead ends and the mistakes that have defined our journey so far. But before we start, I know that some of you in the audience will not be familiar with the game of rugby. So I've put together a very quick primer. A rugby team is made up of 15 players. Eight of them are forwards, seven are backline players. The forwards are generally bigger and stronger than the backline players, who are generally faster and more agile. The forwards are responsible for executing most of the set plays that consist of scrums, rucks, and mauls, which are essentially organized fights for the ball and lineouts. A lineout is like a throw-in, except teams choose a player to lift and catch the ball. 
the opposition team may try to guess which player the ball is going to um, and lift one of their own players to compete. The person who throws the ball at the lineout must throw very accurately. They must throw at a known speed and to a known height so that their teammates can catch it and keep possession. A scrum is a dark art in rugby. Extreme physical strength is required and the players that bind in the front row are often the highest paid on the team. A scrum is an ordered formation of players used to restart play in which the forwards of a team form up with arms interlocked and heads down and push forward against a similar group from the opposing side. The ball's thrown into the middle and the players try to regain possession of it by hooking it backwards towards their own side. And in rugby, finally, the pass, you're only allowed to pass backwards. And if you pass forwards, it's a penalty to the opposite team and possession is lost. If only it was so simple, because it's not. The forward pass is a rule that allows for relative motion of the ball. After all, if a player is running with the ball and passes to a teammate who's behind them, the ball can and often does travel forward because of its own forward momentum. And this is not a forward pass. So it sounds like a fair rule, but it makes officiating almost impossible due to errors of parallax and complex relative motion between the passer, the receiver, and the referee. So now that you're all experts in rugby, let's turn to the problem statement. I don't think any of you will be surprised to hear that a, su a successful team has skillful players. I'd go a step further and say that the success of a team ultimately comes down to the skill of the players as individuals and as a cohesive unit. Skill is therefore an essential ingredient for the success of a team as a business. When it comes to leagues, which for the purposes of tonight are commercial bodies made up of professional teams, having talented players is important, but the most successful leagues don't necessarily have the best players. For example, in football or soccer, the Premier League arguably lags behind Bundesliga and La Liga in terms of having the world's best players. However, the Premier League is unquestionably the world's most successful football league. Rather, a league's success depends on its ability to celebrate skill and to communicate it effectively with fans and would-be fans. So in simple terms, nurturing and growing skill and communicating and celebrating it are essential for the commercial success of teams and leagues. So if skill is so important, what is it? In rugby, like most contact sports, skill is associated with how adept a player is at running into space, passing, kicking, tackling, set play, like scrums and lineouts, as well as decision-making. And furthermore, a good player should execute these tasks accurately and repeatedly in all conditions. There are other factors that could be included in this list, but by and large, this is not controversial. By doing these things well, and by doing them well regularly, a team maximizes its chances of winning. So the big question is, how do teams measure accuracy, for example, or how do they act measure how accurately and repeatably players can pass, for example? So to know this, you would need to know what they're passing towards and where the pass landed with respect to the target. The pass error would need to be recorded over time. The average error is then an indicator for the player's accuracy. A smaller average error would indicate a better passer. The standard deviation of the player's error is then a measure of how repeatably the player can pass, or rather how reliable they are as a teammate, or even that could be a measurement of their big match temperament factor, their BMT. The standard deviation of the player's error is the indicator of their repeatability. And this is the same in kicking. You need to know where the player is kicking towards and what the error is and how it evolves over time. When it comes to tackling, a team should know what a player's average body position is during a tackle, which shoulder is preferred, what the peak forces are, and what the total impulse transferred is during a tackle. When it comes to lineouts, teams should know what the accuracy of the throw is, the standard deviation of the thrower's error, the height a player can jump to, and in what time they can reach their peak height. So 
how are these things measured? The answer today is that they basically aren't. In elite rugby clubs, kicking hang time is measured with a stopwatch and often not recorded on paper or electronically. Passing is assessed by eye or by aiming at a car tire or just by passing to another player. Kicks for poles are assessed as binary outcomes, through the poles or not. And this is true not just in rugby, but also in Aussie rules, rugby league, and to a great extent in American football. One of England's best rugby players once said to me, I honestly don't know if I've gotten better at kicking or worse over the last seven years. And this is the crux of the problem. In rugby and in other contact sports, the ability of players to execute tasks accurately and repeatedly is largely not measured. And when it is measured, it is usually done so ineffectively. This failure to quantify leads to players not reaching their potential and lost return on investment for clubs. Failure to quantify leads to lost revenues for leagues since player skill is not effectively communicated with existing or would-be fans. The solution is to measure skill, to measure passing accuracy, kicking accuracy, tackle technique, running into space, and performance in set plays. To do this, you must track the ball in 3D, track the players in 3D, and measure tackle and scrum forces. And to make it relevant for the broadcaster and viewers, this must be done in real time. So this is what Sportable has done. We've built all the hardware that you need to track every player and the ball in 3D and every impact and hit within 100 milliseconds of it happening. The technology works indoors, outdoors, and in all weather conditions. We've built the entire tech stack from end to end with the sole purpose of measuring skill and celebrating it in real time. So how does the system measure skill? We get a lot of data from our hardware and it's all streamed in real time to a pitch side server, which converts the data into useful information. So for example, from all the balls, because there's often one in play, but a few in um, held on the side of the field, we get their 3D position, 3D velocity, acceleration, spin, orientation, compass, and pressure. And we get similar data for every single player on the field, as well as uh, their body orientation as a quaternion and the forces on their shoulders and real time heart rate. So the server on the side of the field takes all this information and it passes it through our data science package, which is essentially um, a bunch of algorithms, neural nets, and heuristics that we use to determine things in real time, such as who has possession. We're all also able to pick out every single pass and clip it in time. And we're able to include information such as who made the pass, who received the pass, the distance that it traveled, the spin, the wobble, the speed, the accuracy. Similarly, for each kick, we can clip it in real time and include who made the kick, who received it, where it started, where it landed, how high it went, its hang time, the spin, and what kind of a kick it was. So we can drill down. We can say if it was a clearance kick, a penalty, a conversion, a drop goal, a restart, a box kick, a chip and chase. Our machine learning algorithms do the same for every set move. So we can pick out every scrum, every line out, and every ruck. And we can determine things like when the scrum started, when it finished, its rotation angle, the outcome. And we do this for phases of play. And we can produce match stats. We can even score the game using these algorithms. As an added benefit, we're able to automate certain officiation decisions, which are highly error prone. For example, we were speaking about the forward pass earlier. And it sounds simple, but it's a nightmare to officiate. And fans, if you love rugby, you get very sick of watching replay after replay after replay of an alleged forward pass. We're also able to automate where the ball was kicked out, when a player is not back 10, when a player is in front of the kicker, and did the ball go through the poles. And this is another one of our aspirations, to be the Hawkeye of contact sports. So we call our system Halo, and we hope that it's going to make players better teams more competitive, games faster, and contact sports more enjoyable for everyone. So how does it work? We put a number of reference devices around the pitch, which we call anchors. 
the number of anchors can vary from six devices for training to 16 devices for game day. And in the image, you'll see the anchors are the yellow dots with the black squares around them that go around the pitch. The devices are all part of a time division multiple access network or a TDMA network, which carefully regulates when the devices can and cannot transmit messages. This carefully synchronized network sends messages to the players and ball devices, and the player and ball devices respond with messages containing data from their sensors. The network records either the time it took for those messages to travel to the player and ball device and back again, which is known as time of flight, or otherwise it records the time difference between a reference anchor receiving the messages and the rest of the anchors receiving the messages. This is known as time difference of arrival. All of this data, which is made up of sensor readings and timestamps, is sent by the anchors to a local server near the pitch, either wirelessly or through an ethernet network. The server performs time critical calculations, such as calculating position, orientation, and event detection. And it then streams these to a cloud server. We send data to clients in two ways. For situations which are latency critical, they receive data directly from the local server. For less latency critical applications, clients can query the data via a cloud server, API, or WebSocket. So that's the pitch. And I hope you guys like it, and I hope it sounds exciting, because I think it is. And I hope it was clear to you, because hindsight should be clear. But I can promise you that the process of starting this company was anything but clear to me or my co-founders. So let me take you back to the beginning where this all starts in 2013, the first year of my PhD. Our eureka moment came when I was working in Idaho one summer during my PhD. I'd been lucky enough to get a job for NASA working on nuclear reactors, specifically nuclear reactors for deep space missions. So it'll come as no surprise to you that my teammates and I were obsessed with numbers. We were watching ice hockey one day at Buffalo Wild Wings when we saw a collision on the ice that got all of us talking. What was the peak force in the collision? How long was the contact time? What was the change in momentum? Would I walk away from that? And why isn't this on TV? That was in June, 2013. In September of 2013, I pitched the idea to my best mate, Dougal McDonald, who was studying at Oxford at the time, and who was also playing for the Blues rugby team. Dougal loved the idea and phoned me the next day and said, we're starting a business. The idea at this stage was a simple three-step plan. First, we were gonna build some kind of a smart shirt that uses some kind of sensor to measure forces. And these are then transmitted somehow, maybe Wi-Fi or something, to a computer or a Raspberry Pi. Then the second step is we'd put the data on TV. And the third step was we would profit. So we had an idea. Now all we needed to do was incorporate the company and think of a catchy name. Eight months later, in May 2014, we incorporated Impact Telemetry Systems Limited. It seriously took us eight months to come up with a name. And I'm grateful to tell you guys we scrapped it for the name Sportable a few months later. So Dougal and I got to work. It was time to build a proof of concept. But the problem was that we didn't understand electronics at all. We needed help. So I called my friend Dan Dabson, who I'd studied with during my undergraduate. Dan liked the idea and agreed to come on board as the third co-founder and resident electronics expert. Through consultation with Dan, the idea crystallized into actual sensors, which were measured with analog circuitry and digitized with an analog to digital converter. The values were read from the ADC at 60 Hertz and were transmitted to a Raspberry Pi over Wi-Fi using an NRF 24L01 plus module and open source code gleaned from the internet. We sourced cables, connectors, and components. We got our first custom circuit boards made and assembled. Another friend 3D printed us some enclosures, which we spray painted black and then used some sugar to emboss the logo. We built our sensor assembly and encased the sensors in protective EVA foam and bound the edges with nylon ribbon. We got a special shirt custom made to hold the sensor assembly while on the player's body. And we even made a display box 
which ended up looking like a pizza box. I can't tell you how embarrassing it was taking that pizza box to pitches only to see the disappointed faces of potential investors when they realized that they weren't actually getting pizza for lunch. When we weren't designing pizza boxes, we were doing useful things like interacting with other friends of ours who had a software development business. We hired them to develop a web app, which we could use to display the data. We developed the proof of concept in our spare time. I was doing this during my PhD. Dougal was doing this while he was working on a mine in Zimbabwe. And Dan was doing this in his evenings after his main job. After 16 months, we had all the components ready. The shoulder sensors, the player monitoring device, the Raspberry Pi receiver, and the web app to display the data in real time. The day that we integrated the proof of concept system in September 2015 was an incredible day and it was an incredible high and a feeling of accomplishment. And I've got it on video. So I'm going to share with you the video of Dan filming the second demo of our new product. Second demo, here we go. <laughs> Just right, in, right off the charts, guys. The sensor is so far back in my back that I've got to tackle in the most uncomfortable way possible. Yeah, sure. You just don't know how you to play rugby. Just, just hit him. Oh! Let's <laughs> do a little scrum there. Okay. 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 Zero event, guys. And uh, I apologize for the poor scrumming at the end. So we were convinced that as soon as an investor saw our pizza box, we'd be rich. The reality, of course, was very different. We pitched our idea to potential investors over the course of about three months, and we received many, many very polite and encouraging rejections. After easily our 50th pitch, we met our first investor and mentor, Aidan Cooney, the founder of Opta, Europe's largest sports data company. We met Aidan in December 2015. He and his group pointed out things to us that are perfectly obvious now. Firstly, he told us that players were already wearing GPS devices between their shoulder blades, and they weren't now going to wear a second device there. He also pointed out that there's no way that Wi-Fi could be used to offload data from a player in a crowded stadium. And this was something that we hadn't really thought about. But despite this, he thought we were onto something. Nobody was measuring tackle or scrum forces in rugby or forces in contact sports in general. This was an existing pain point, and so it could work as a business. Aiden said to Dougal and me that him and his cohort would invest in Sportable, but only if we could add player tracking. And furthermore, the player tracking must work indoors, and it must work in real time. I looked at Aiden with full confidence and said, we can do that. I was confident we could do it, because to be honest, at that time, I believed I could do anything given enough time and resources. And I still do think that to an extent, but I've been tempered slightly by experience. So this is a good place to stop and consider what we did well and didn't do well. Dougal and I had identified a market problem, but we had mischaracterized it. In our minds, fans wanted to know how big a big hit is and broadcasters would pay for that. But in reality, teams were more interested in maximizing player performance and safety. We had incorporated a business, but we focused too much energy on the minutiae. We had spent hours and hours debating which sewing technique would best bind the edge of the force pad and which foam we should use. These are important decisions for a prototype or an MVP, which is a minimum viable product, but not for a proof of concept. We'd spent days on a company logo and getting business cards made. We made a display case that looked like a pepperoni pizza. These two are important things, but not for a young hardware startup at the proof of concept stage. We would put together a business model, but we didn't understand the buying behavior of teams or leagues. We would built a working proof of concept, but we didn't know the difference between proof of concept and prototype and minimum viable product. We'd applied for a patent and then lost 3,000 pounds when the examiner came back saying there was nothing inventive about our idea. That was when I learned firsthand how expensive lawyers are. 
And while I hope that those of you out there who are considering starting your own business can learn from our mistakes, it's important to remember that mistakes are impossible to avoid totally. And in fact, a few survival mistakes are actually very good for your own personal development and for that of your business. So remember Pope's words, to err is human, to forgive divine. So make mistakes and forgive yourself and keep going. Through Aiden and his group, we raised 150,000 pounds of seed funding under the SEIS scheme. We were ecstatic to have the vote of confidence and the seed money, which was a huge milestone in our lives. But it slowly dawned on Dan Dougal and I that the finish line we thought we'd just reached was in fact just the starting point of another bigger event. In fact, the main event. A much longer and tougher road was in front of us. At this stage, I had just finished my PhD and so moved to London to live with Dougald and another friend who was also in the process of starting a business. We converted a room in the house into an office and we got to work full time. And in the image, you can see all nine square meters of our office where everything was made, assembled and tested. In 2016, we teamed up with an industrial tracking company. This was the first commercial relationship we'd ever entered into. And so we were absolutely naive. It was an important relationship for us. Their technology would enable us to track players indoor and outside. And this would enable us to make good on the promise to Aiden. Over the course of a single year in 2016, the entire system, all the hardware and software was redesigned from the ground up with these new partners. We made new PCBs, new injection molded enclosures in a special RF grade thermoplastic. We got custom force sensors designed and manufactured. We wrote a lot of signal processing and filtering algorithms. In June, we approached Gilbert and began building a proof of concept ball to demonstrate the tracking to them. So there was a lot going on in 2016. I even got a cherry picker driver's license, which I used to install electronics at the top of lighting posts around rugby fields. I've clocked hundreds of hours in a cherry picker basket. 17 meters above the ground, doing work that is much more dangerous than my shareholders were comfortable with. One of the things that Dougal and I believe very firmly in is the power of deadlines. There's nothing like a big event or an important deadline to catalyze action. And so Dougal was looking for a suitably big event that we could use to launch the system. It occurred to him that if we could track all the players in the annual varsity match between Cambridge and Oxford, then we would have demonstrated live tracking and live player data at Twickenham, one of the world's oldest and most recognizable and biggest rugby stadiums. And so we teamed up with the varsity match and World Rugby to deliver the first live player tracking data in rugby. But please bear in mind that we'd only tracked around club rugby fields to this point. We had never tracked in a massive stadium before. Furthermore, to track in this bigger stadium, required small changes to the firmware that had been developed by those tracking partners I told you about. They assured us that this would be simple and that it would be delivered weeks before the game. What followed was the most stressful thing that I have ever gone through. We trusted that our partners would make the necessary changes to the firmware in time for us to track all the players at the varsity match. And we began the process of planning for the big day. Due to time constraints, Twickenham could only give us six days to set up the system before the game. And so when those six days started, we were in Twickenham Stadium at 8 a.m. We began by installing the anchors, which go around the pitch and receive the signals from the players. But the going was slow. The stadium is huge and access in a large facility is a real problem. For those of you who know the show The Crystal Maze, it's like that but much bigger and cold and dark and not fun. If you don't have an access card, you're not getting in. If you've got an access card with limited access, you're probably not getting in. If one door blocks you, the next door could be 500 meters away, or you might need to come down from floor six to floor one and then jump into an adjacent elevator and go to floor five and try another door that's probably also locked. Now do this with massive boxes of cables, antennas, 
and surveying equipment, and you'll understand the frustration and growing panic. To top it all off, it was freezing, and our hands were getting raw from carrying things, and we were still waiting for our partners to send the code they had promised us weeks ago. After three days, we finally got all the devices installed and calibrated. We switched on the tracking system and found that we could track one player, but only when we held the player device above our heads. When we put it in position, which is usually between the shoulder blades, the tracking became totally unusable. And still we had no word from our partners and they're also unreachable by phone. The pressure was getting to us. Dougal had invited every major decision maker in the premiership and at the RFU to come and watch our tracking live on game day. All of these stakeholders would be watching little dots representing the players moving around on a screen in real time. And so they could actually just compare the position of the players on the pitch to the players on the, on the screen. So we had nowhere to hide. The varsity match was also counting on us. The statistics from the game were going to be used for fan engagement on the big screen. And they'd found a data sponsor for the event. We now had three days to go to get everything in working order before 18,000 fans poured into Twickenham to watch the game. With two days left, our tracking partners sent us a new firmware binary. This is essentially the code that makes all the anchor devices run and offload data. To install this firmware on the anchors, we had to take each anchor down one at a time, remove the screws that hold it together and attach a programmer to its JTAG interface and then run a script on a laptop to reflash the device with the new firmware. We followed this procedure for all 16 anchors around the field and then ran down to our pitch side headquarters, which you can see in the image there, where our freezing laptops were kept. We turned the system on and it crashed. It was worse than before. With one day to go, our tracking partners sent us another firmware binary. We ran around the stadium and reflashed all the anchors with the new firmware. We started the system up and the tracking worked at the edge of the field, but not at all in the middle of the field. Dan and Dougal and I were in shock. All of us had different opinions on what the right thing to do was. You can imagine there are a lot of stakeholders relying on us and no one quite knew what the best thing to do was. Is it best to never give up? Or should we not flog a dead horse? What was the responsible thing to do? After a lot of shouting and cursing and thinking and debating, Dan and I realized at 11 p.m. with 12 hours to go that the behavior of the system could be explained by long range measurements being excluded. And so we decided to risk it all and to try to fix the problem one last time rather than pull it out. I called our tracking partner and explained the situation to him. I told him that everything that we had worked for for the past three years came down to his actions over the next 12 hours. He told me that he was on a highway in Germany on the way to see his parents-in-law. I told him to kindly stop the car and please fix the problem he would promised would have been fixed weeks ago. Dougal and Dan and I woke up at 5 a.m. on game day. I cannot tell you the dread and the sadness that we felt. But we put on brave faces and we tried to encourage each other and we started the long journey towards Twickenham. We got to the stadium at 6.30 a.m. and went up to the suite. We started to clean up the suite and set up the big screen TV and get everything ready for the representatives of Premiership Rugby and the RFU, as well as potential investors. And the whole process, to be honest, just felt completely pointless. At 6.45 a.m., with four hours and 15 minutes before kickoff, I got an email with new firmware binary. Dan and I sprang into action. We raced around the stadium, reflashing the 16 anchors. By 7.30 a.m., we had reflashed everything, and we were back in the suite, and we turned the system on. It was stable. I ran down to the field with a tracking tag. Dan reported back to me that the position looked good. I ran across the field. Dan reported back that position at the center of the field looked good. So I ran up to the suite 
and taped 15 tracking tags to a cardboard box to do a full team's worth of tracking. I ran down to the field and ran in big loops. Dan reported back over the walkie-talkie that it all looked perfect. I could hear Dan and Dougal shouting with excitement in the suite. Our first live game day went off perfectly. Well, except for the fact that 11 players forgot to wear their tracking devices. So all in all, we tracked 19 players in real time at Twickenham, which was a world first. We used the data to calculate how far the players had run, their top speeds, and the calories they'd burnt. We put this data into a graphical template, which was then shown on the big screen in the stadium. Dan and Dougal and I were completely broken after the game ended. It was without doubt the hardest, most stressful and most mentally jarring thing I've ever done in my whole life. But we pulled it off and somehow everyone was happy. Because of that game, we were able to raise another round of investment, which enabled us to hire a software developer, a hardware engineer, a software architect and a data scientist. We got an office in Exmouth Market in London and we continued to build the system but this time we focused on the ball and the algorithms that supported it. I wish at this point I could tell you that we would told the, our tracking partners to take a hike after that incredibly poor performance. But to be honest, we weren't exactly sure how to extricate ourselves from them. Our technology stack relied on them hugely. And so in some ways we'd become their captors. Thankfully, External events took the decision out of our hands. In late 2017, the tracking partners fell out, their company folded, and the hardware that we relied on was gone. We therefore launched Project Nighthawk. The aim of the project was to rebuild our entire system from the ground up for the third time in four years. I cannot stress to you what a big project this was. We needed to develop three PCBs, one for the ball, one for the player, and one for the anchor. The technology stack alone is huge. I mean, forget about having to install these things and the supporting infrastructure and the mechanical enclosures. Just the tech stack on the devices alone is enormous. The system synchronization is critical and you're developing a system that is running on computationally low power devices like a Cortex M4 microprocessor. So you've essentially got to write your own operating system, which is known as an RTOS for your devices. In conjunction to all of this, you have to write your own TDMA scheme, which is essentially your own single cell mobile phone network. It took us nearly two years, but we did it. And more importantly, we did it better. We built a system we can set up in literally seconds and not six days. Calibration is automatic. Events are handled smoothly. Data synchronizes into the cloud seamlessly, even with an intermittent internet connection. It was exhausting and we never intended to build everything ourselves three times, but events outside of our control forced our hand. And that's how after four years, we owned the entire tracking stack from top to bottom, all the hardware, software, embedded software, algorithms, intellectual property, and 12 patents to boot. For the last year, we've been using our system with professional teams and doing live events as we try to break into the major tournaments. And I'm happy to tell you that we're much better at live events now. But to be honest, something always goes wrong, no matter how much you plan. So you must plan for things to go wrong. In May 2019, we teamed up with a major broadcaster here in the UK to track our smart ball in the Championship Cup final. This is the league directly below the Premiership. During the final, the plan was that we would track the ball live and capture all the kicks for poles. The kicks for poles would then be shown as augmented reality graphics next to the kicker as he is lining up his kick. And you can see the output in the image on your left hand side. We'd prepared for months for this event and we did three full days of successful testing and integration with the broadcaster before the game. Then on game day, with two hours to go before the start of the match, the camera system that makes the augmented reality possible broke. Now, this would have normally given me a heart attack a few years ago, but I'm much more used to it now. And we, we knew it would be fine. One of the broadcasting team jumped in his car and raced off to their headquarters, which was at Heathrow Airport. 
He was obviously not back by the time the game started, but about 15 minutes in, he came back with a spare, fitted it to the camera, and it worked. The augmented reality graphics worked well, and the commentary team were happy about it. They even gave me and my business partner a double thumbs up, like we were a couple of Top Gun rookies. And our really big break came when we were invited by Rugby X to provide live match statistics and automated officiation at their first event, which showcased some of the world's best Rugby Sevens players. The event was an indoors event, so it needed indoors tracking at the O2 in London. And the event was broadcast to 2 million people live on ITV4. Thankfully, the event went off very smoothly. There were no surprises because we planned for everything to go wrong twice. Our smart ball was used to measure the scorer's speed, team territory, and where the ball was kicked out, and also to officiate the game's new rule, no kicks above 10 meters in height. And this was the first time in, in rugby that uh, automatic officiation has been used. The event was highly successful, and as a result, we were picked up by The Economist, by Forbes, and we got pretty much a full page spread in The Times. This was followed by us being invited onto Rugby Tonight, one of the most popular rugby talk shows to demonstrate our tracking and tackle measurement technology live on air. We even did a demonstration of automatic forward pass detection live on air. And one of our shareholders actually got in touch with us and said, you're either idiots or geniuses. But luckily that night we were lucky and everything worked as we'd prepared. After Rugby Tonight, we finally did it and were invited by BT Sport to do our first premiership game. And that game would have been between Leicester and Bristol, which would have been on the 30th of May. And unfortunately, due to current circumstances, it's been postponed. And so even though the game's been delayed, we're still obviously so happy that we've almost achieved that very simple three-step plan from all those years ago. It turned out to be a little bit longer and harder than we had anticipated, but I wouldn't change any of it. I've learned more in the last seven years than I can possibly explain to you. And I think the biggest lessons I've learned are mainly about myself and about human nature, about how to be diplomatic, how to resolve issues within our team, how to motivate and lead people during exhausting and nerve wracking times. In many ways, not to sound cheesy, but the making of the world's first smart rugby ball was in many ways my own making as an aspiring entrepreneur, as a human being, and for the last two years as a father. It's been an incredible journey of discovery and learning, and I wish all of you the very best on your own journeys. And if there's one thing I can leave with you, just remember this, you are all capable of much more than you know. Thank you so much. Well, Pete, that was absolutely fabulous. Um, what a nice blend of uh, uh, technology and engineering and games and beer, I noticed in your video. <laughs> Presumably that had a part to play. Absolutely. Uh, well, we're, we're into questions now. And the first one I see up is from John Wilkin, who asks, how transferable is the technology to other sports? Well, great question. And um, I'm going to address John's question and add in some more information. So I didn't address the competitive landscape because I had a lot of content in this feature already. So currently in terms of competitors, we've got another team, another company doing American football and another company doing basketball. And, you know, we've got our own secret sauce that uh, we think, you know, makes our product offering slightly better. But to answer John's question directly, it's absolutely transferable. Um, in many ways, we started with rugby despite it being a sport with less money, partially because it was a good sport to incubate the technology and also partially because rugby has some of the most difficult aspects of any sport. The field is longer and wider than an American football field. And so your radio frequency connection between your, your anchors and your devices or your gateways and your devices is much longer. And that's a very difficult thing to get right. I mean, you're, it's called your link budget. You need to make sure that your devices are able to communicate robustly. Um, and, you know, in rugby, there's nowhere to hide your devices. So, you know, you, don't, you can't hide it under um, protective gear that they're wearing in, say, ice hockey or American football. And so, you know, the, the technology is incredibly transferable. We've, um, 
I already adapted the system to American football and making, starting to make a break into the US football market with Wilson, um, who we're starting an, an, a nascent partnership with. And um, we're, we're you know, keen to, to look into other sports, but also not to get distracted. You know, as a startup, there's so many bells and flashes and, and tinsel around you vying for your attention. It's important to stay focused as well. So uh, that's a long answer to a simple question. Great, thank you. Uh, and I see John Cook would like to ask a question. John, please. Uh, hello, Pete. Thanks very much for a fascinating talk. Um, I've done quite a lot of uh, sensors myself for challenging environments, and I was wondering about the actual technical nature of the sensor in the ball in particular, because that's quite a high shock environment. How, what steps did you have to take technically to make sure your sensor and, and your circuit board and your transmitter survived the, the very first kick? I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And, and the answer to that is, you know, many, many, many iterations. Uh, we've gone through possibly nearly 20 iterations of the ball now. I think I've, I've forgotten the exact number. And um, you can imagine it's yeah, very, very high G environment. The ball accelerates at an incredibly rapid pace. And um, you need to make the ball the exact mass of an expected rugby ball, which is about 454 grams. It needs to be rotationally balanced, so players must detect zero abnormal eccentricity to the ball. Um, so these are things you've got to very carefully tailor. And another thing you'll be interested to hear is that the acoustic response of the ball is absolutely critical. So if you look in golf, Callaway changed the head of the golf club so that they could improve the driving range of their clubs. But the problem is to achieve this, they, they implemented a hollow core but that changed the resonance of the golf club head. And acoustic feedback is the primary feedback that a player uses to assess how well they've done an, an action. Now in golf, it's the ping of the golf ball, but in rugby, it's the sound of the ball off the boot. And so we'd actually tried to save weight by moving to a, um, to a different material for the bladder. And players interpreted that as the ball being lighter, but it wasn't, it was exactly the same weight. And so, um, you know, another long answer to a simple question, We've been working with um, a spin-out from Loughborough University called Progressive Sports Technologies, and they have access to all of Loughborough's amazing equipment. And we've put the ball through robotic kick testing machines where we can uh, vary the, 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 the muzzle velocity of the ball as it leaves the boot up to 130 kilometers an hour. And essentially, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, it's difficult to use finite elements on a, on a, simple, on a problem like this. You're using highly nonlinear materials. It's almost not even worth trying to get a material model. Uh, you know, we believe in the cowboy approach is to make it and test it. In so far as it's possible in hardware, we're, we're stuff expensive to make. Okay, great. thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Um, Andrew Shepard asks, uh, why was indoor tracking supposedly a bigger challenge? Well, it's, it's a great question. Um, indoor tracking, for example, most tracking when we, since tracking began in rugby has been GPS and you know, GPS, the technology has been getting miniaturized more and more and more over the years. And you can still remember the large handheld GPS devices from the late nineties, early two thousands. And you know, the advent of mobile phones started really miniaturizing the hardware. And in the about 2007, eight around there is when other companies started using GPS in sports. So GPS was the de facto standard for tracking back then. Um, and obviously GPS doesn't work indoors. And that was the issue is GPS obviously does not work indoors, but also really struggles in stadiums. The, the issue there is that the accuracy of your location in GPS is measured by a parameter called your dilution of precision, your geometric dilution of precision. And that can be calculated from the geometry of the satellites that you can see. And so essentially, if you're in a stadium that's blocking out the horizon, you're losing satellites on the horizon, which are critical to, to improving the geometry. And what happens is you end up with satellites directly above you, which create this kind of, um, this isosceles triangle, is that the right word? Uh, they, they create this triangle with the wrong kind of geometry. I've been out of university for too long. Uh, that essentially amplifies errors and your geometric dilution of precision becomes bad in stadiums. And so going to other tracking technologies indoors, the issue then becomes cost. 
you know, you could, sure, you could use possibly radar, but there's issues with trying to bombard players with radar. And it's expensive. And there's nothing off the shelf. I mean, generally speaking, when you leave university, you want to be using stuff and components that are off the shelf as much as possible. And so we relied on a technology called ultra wideband, which had just been essentially developed in 2011 by a company based in Ireland. And they'd managed to put all the technology you need into Silicon, which essentially brought the, the cost factor down enough for a company like ours to start developing and scaling um, a product like this. So it, it was a big challenge. Um, you know, while there are ways in terms of textbook applications for tracking indoors, it was a challenge to find and develop something that was relatively off the shelf and cost effective that we could actually get a business case out of it. Great, thank you. Uh, and now a question from John Green, um, who says, you mentioned cloud services, which cloud provider or partner do you use, please? <laughs> so um, we've been um, working closely with Amazon and Microsoft. Um, we currently use AWS for a lot of our services, but um, that's, uh, that no one's been ruled out yet. <laughs> so there's a business opportunity for you there, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, um, I would encourage people to put your hand up or tap in a question if you would like to. Oh, yes. Uh, right. There's a, yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, and now, who's that going to ask a question? Is that Valerie? Valerie, would you like to ask, ask your question, please? So it wasn't quite it wasn't clear, clear to me. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Can you tell me? Sorry, too much technology. Um, how will this affect the scrums? Is it going to be possible to be able to see who's turning a scrum, who's coming up in a scrum, um, and who's getting things wrong? Usually that's something that's very difficult to referee. Mm. Well, it's a, it's a great question. And um, the truth is that our technology will enable us to do all of this. But um, for, at the moment, for example, you can look at things like uh, pushing uh, before the ball's in. It's a very simple thing to look at. Uh, we can actually measure the rotation angle of the scrum. That's not a difficult thing for a referee to assess, but it's something that we can record for posterity and for kind of uh, drilling deeper into the data science. Um, and then we can, one of the things that we actually use the technology for on Rugby Tonight, and Ben Kay, one of the hosts of the show, is, was looking at the interrelation between the tight head and the loose head props and how basically the, the tight head prop can scrum in on the opposing hooker, which causes his loose head opponent to move in to take up the, the burden. And he then gets blown but meanwhile, the infringement was caused, uh, the, the origination of the infringement was caused by the tight head. And so this is a very difficult thing for referees to assess in real time. And you know, this is the thing that Dougal and I talk about to, to everyone who's, who's willing to listen, is that rugby is an incredibly complicated game. It's very, very high dimensional. It's not like games like football, soccer, or tennis. It's a very high dimensional game and referees have an almost impossible job of evaluating incredibly talented athletes who, because they're talented athletes, get good at bending the rules to the, in their favor. Um, it's very difficult for referees to look at 16 players in a scrum simultaneously and to assess um, you know, something that could affect the outcome of a game. It's a, I, I really don't envy referees. It's a very difficult job. Thanks, Reed. Um I can see uh, that John is on the video, if you'd like to ask your question, John. Okay, thank you. A very interesting talk. Thank you very much indeed. Um, but now the tricky question. Um, when do you think you're actually going to make money doing this? Uh, that's a great, great question, John. So um, as, as the startup going through the kind of startup and growth phases, 
we've literally just now started to commercialize all of the products that we've generated. So Rugby X last year was the first paid event that we did um, for broadcast services and officiation. So that was essentially proving the broadcast model as a commercial uh, relationship. And since then, we've started commercializing with um, some of the biggest teams in the UK. So we've signed up some of the premiership teams um, and we're making good headway with getting England and England sevens on as customers. So, um, you know, coronavirus has delayed our commercial timelines, but um, I think in some ways um, that it's, it's actually a good thing for us in a weird way, in a silver lining kind of way. And that it, it really gets the message home to leagues that you need to make hay while the sun shines. And essentially technology like ours is incredibly useful for attracting a new audience of younger viewers, um, you know, especially the millennial and Gen Xers who interact with sports in a totally different way. You know, they don't interact with sports through um, linear broadcasting. They generally do it through streaming services and so on, or through an app. And so I think that's where you know, it really makes our technology more important and more relevant today. Fascinating. Uh, we've got more questions coming in. I'm pleased to say we have one here from Simon Menzer. Uh, Simon asks, do you follow the officials too? So it's a good, great question. So we, we haven't traditionally put our devices on the officials, but it is absolutely something we're looking at. It's a total no brainer. I mean, first of all, it's, it's fascinating. Like the, which audience member wouldn't be interested by how far, um, you know, your referee and your touch judges have run over the course of the evening. Um, so, you know, they actually are working very hard to, to keep up to date with what's going on in the game. Um, and I think actually it's, it's not just interesting, it's very important information to know where a referee was when a decision was made. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. It's something that we will be looking into with um, our partners in the, at the league. Excellent. Um, and Robin Bly asks, does your technology replace Hawkeye? So fantastic question. And I think the answer to that is no. I mean, we are, we, we, we can live and coexist with Hawkeye very happily with different technologies, with different strengths. Hawkeye is an amazing technology that actually inspired us and no doubt, you know, countless other companies in sports technology. Um, the technology is incredible, but it's got its limitations. And that's essentially one of the things we identified early on when starting the company is that Computer vision is an amazing technology, but where its applications are, where it's suitable. And computer vision doesn't scale particularly well into sports with many players, like rugby, who group and bunch a lot. There's lots of obstructions. And finally, when you've got a ball that's not spherically symmetric, you can imagine for some of your you know, convolutional neural nets, looking for a spherically symmetrical object is much easier than looking for any one of a class of ellipsoids. Um, and so it's a, it's a very, very difficult task for computer vision to track objects that are crossing over all the time, bunching, obstructing, and so on. I think one of the things where I may be cheeky and venture an opinion here, where we could possibly do a, a good job um, is in VAR. And I think the issue from, from my, this is my personal opinion, the issue with VAR in football is that it's not real time and that the decision is made because the computer vision algorithms take a while to run. The decision of whether or not it was offside or not take a while to catch up. And so by the time the referee blows uh, for the infringement, a, a goal has often been scored. And then you are in the unenviable position of taking a goal away from the team that's now celebrating. And this is bad for sports. It's bad for TV because it means that fans now um, check themselves before celebrating, before they kind of let into that, that exuberance of having scored a goal, they're now having to gut check themselves. And I think if you had identified it in real time, which is what our technology does, within a few you know, hundred milliseconds of the event, it's offsides, I think people wouldn't be as averse to the technology because nothing's being taken away from them. That does sound like a major business opportunity. <laughs> Um, I believe we have Colin Fox on video. Would you like to ask your question, Colin? Hi. Can you see any possibility of it being used to judge high board diving? 
even though I appreciate there's probably some difficulty of where to put the body sensors. Well, do you know, Colin, that's a fantastic idea. And I think, to be honest, if I put my business hat on, I'd say yes, but, you know, we can do it. Um, if I took my business hat off and, you know, go back to being an engineer, I might say that a computer vision algorithm might be more, um, might be a more suitable technology to work with. You've generally got a single object in, in, in frame. Um, it's only one thing to look at. And there are already algorithms that look at body pose and estimation that are quite well adapted to this kind of problem. Um, so for someone in the audience, there's a great business idea. Or Colin, there you go. Thanks very much. Um, Alex Reed has sent in a question. Uh, he asks, is there any resistance from players to having their performance so precisely measured? It's a fantastic question. You know, the, the psychology of, of dealing with elite athletes, you can, the technology comes second. What comes first is the psychology and the comfort of the players. Like that is the biggest thing. And that's the reason why we engineered the sound of the ball off the boot so carefully. Players come first. And um, ultimately, luckily, we're not really changing any of the habits of players. Players have been wearing GPS devices between their shoulder blades for a long time. So the elite athletes are really used to being tracked and assessed and having those assessments and that data being used in terms of, uh, and, and the performance of games being used to assess, you know, if they're going to be picked for a team or not. But what we've found actually is that many players are really looking forward to more data being um, measured about them. Because there's a, there's a, in psychology, there's a thing called selection anxiety that players suffer from. Whether or not you'll be selected for the next game is a huge, huge pressure on professional athletes. And a lot of athletes that we know have said to us that they're excited to see and to show once and for all that, in fact, their kicks are more accurate and their passes are better. Well, uh, fascinating. <laughs> and of course, we tend to forget that uh, uh, sports people like their performance measured, um, where some of us would rather not. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm looking to see if there are any other questions, but I don't see any hands up or any written questions. So um, you've beaten them into submission uh, very knowledgeably, Pete. Thank you so much for a great talk. Uh, it showed up so many things and particularly uh, from an engineering point of view, it's not enough just to have an idea. You've actually got to do it again and again until you get uh, to a feasible answer. And then you've got to do the business. Um, but now what's so impressive is that you have what is clearly some proprietary technology uh, where there are some huge barriers to entry. So I think we will, everybody will join me in wishing you well. You certainly de deserve to have a huge success and give a lot of people a lot of pleasure and fun as well. So congratulations for a fabulous example uh, of the application of engineering, if not pure science, and that's okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. Cheers.